Thank you for listening, downloading, sharing, subscribing, commenting, donating, and praying for us. And for going to brotherlance.com to get the free PDF of this teaching. That's how you tell if you're unequally yoked. If you're partnering with people, now, and we're not talking perfection, we're talking about people that really want to do something right for God, right? And that they're not perfect. They just know in their heart they need to be walking this direction. They might be going fast. They might be going slow. You know, we're not talking about that. We're talking about people that go like, they're either in a rebellion, you're like, yeah, I'm going to go out and club it and sleep with all the girls I like and steal from my company and that kind of stuff, and I don't care. And Oh, I love the Lord, too. No, you don't. Stop being a liar, right? I mean, you're faking it, right? But if they're like, you know, I struggle with this, or I have a problem with that, but I love God, I keep repenting, I keep my phone. Yeah, great, you're not unequally up because we're all that way. We all have things we're overcoming, right? Christ, right? So what we got? Either you're unequally yoked if they don't love the Lord and they're not willingly trying to be obedient to him, right? Don't call that person a friend because they're not. Because if they can't if they can't get out of rebellion against God, how are they going to get out of rebellion against you, right? They're using you. That's what's happening. You're being used, right? And that's fine that we all get used. The Bible says to be a servant to all men. So I let myself get used by people knowing that's what's happening. That's fine. I'm here to like be an influence in, in people's lives. Use me. OK, but I'm not confusing in my own heart that that's a friendship. Right. And so, you know, and that's fine. But people that love the Lord, I, that's a fellowship. That's a friendship. That's just people that, you know, brass tacks. We're, we're good. OK. Brotherlamps.com Dear Father, thank you so much for your love and many blessings. Thank you for allowing so much, so many of us to be together today and for giving everybody safe travel mercies. Bless our Bible study. Give us the Holy Spirit. Guide us into your truth, Father. Help us understand what true biblical friendship means and not to be enticed by the friendships of the world and false relationships that we call friendships. And so we praise you. We thank you for everything. Bless everybody in our group who is not here today. Continue to work in their hearts and minds and, and strengthen them in your spirit. And we praise you and we love you very much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Okay, so today's is friendship paradigm. So we had brotherly love and then marriage and then we had parenting and now we're having friendship. So it'd be like the end of, I guess, what became a series. I never really start out trying to do series. It just happens that way. So God's like, and now you're doing this one and now you're doing them. Like, yes, Lord, that's what, the one we're doing. So I'm going to go ahead and read our uh, focus verse up at the top. The friendship paradigm to be or not to be. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 12. Two people are better than one because together they have a good reward for their hard work. If one falls, the other can help his friend get up. But how tragic it is for the one who falls is alone when he falls. There is no one to help him to get up. Again, if two people lie together, they can keep warm. But how can one person keep warm? Though one person may be overpowered by another, two people can resist one opponent. A triple braided rope is not easily broken. Right? And so... That's a kind of a focus versus the importance of friendship and having people in our life being the body of Christ. Of course, you know, we're not meant to do it alone. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and read my top part. It says, if you ask most people in the world how many friends they have, I'm sure a large number will start including those who follow them on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. Then they might count their coworkers, people at the gym, etc. But how many of them are just mere acquaintances masquerading as friends? There are shallow relationships that do not go any deeper than barely knowing their names. It also seems that as you get older and have a family, it's even harder to make new friends, let alone devote time to keep them. Then the most important question of the real friends we have is how many are true biblical friends? If we can then point out uh, the true God-centered friendships, we must then graduate. How exactly does God guide us to handle these divine fellowships? That will be the focus of this study. We'll cut away the fat and get down to the friendship meat. In doing so, we will build for ourselves a firm foundation for life in the days of head. Okay? And so... Our Bible study that we're doing now is basically guidelines. We're going to start with warnings, and then we're going to move on to what we're supposed to be doing with our friends. Okay? So, warnings. James 4.4. 4. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship of the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever desires to be friend of the world is the enemy of God. Right. And so a lot of times, especially in Christianity, do they call it ministry and like they pretend and go along, get along with the world. Like there's a real famous pastor who just last his pastoralship online and on TV because he got caught in adultery and stuff. But he was talking about how 
his friends were gay. His friends were this and that. He never talked to him about God and Jesus. They were just friends. Uh-uh, that doesn't work. You know, especially if you're going to be a good friend, you're going to want to tell people about Jesus to help save their soul, not ignore the thing that's going to send them to hell, right? And so we have to be very careful that when we build, quote, unquote, friendships, and business is harder because we have business relationships, but there's a difference between like, oh, we're hanging out, we're doing this, we're going here, we're doing that, you know, come over to the house, you know. And so we have to make sure that like God is our friend, number one, and then we move our people, our, our acquaintances into a relationship with God. If that's not our primary goal, we're in big trouble. All right. Next word, second Corinthians six, 14 through 18. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers for what fellowship does righteousness have with lawlessness <laughs> and what partnership does light have with darkness and what agreement does Christ have with Belial or what part does a believer have with an unbeliever? And what agreement does a temple of God have with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has says, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separated, says the Lord. And do not touch the unclean thing and I will receive you and I will be to you, a uh, father to you. And you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. So right there at the bottom page one, it says, uh, what part do, does a believer have with an unbeliever? So, in churches and in, in in relationships at work and the people we hang out with, e either this you're doing one or two things. You're either influencing or you're being influenced, right? There's, there's only two options. There's like, well, you be you, I'll be me. You know, that's your truth. I have my truth. No, you're influencing each other, right? You're someone's pulling somebody some direction, and usually it's the Christian who starts making the compromises, right? Well, we'll just talk about that. We'll laugh about that. We'll do this. We'll do that. We'll go there. Right. And so you can't really call those type of relationships beneficial, you know, unless you're really there to minister, then somebody's pulling somebody down, you know. And so unless somebody's in a position like they're hurting and they need help and they're willing to be pulled up. Right. And, and brought up to where God and Jesus can bless their lives, you know, then you're going to have an issue. OK. Top of page two. Second Chronicles 9-2. Jehu asked King Jehoshaphat. Why do you help wicked people and love those who hate the Lord? The Lord's anger is directed towards you because you have done this, right? So what happens when we sit there and try to promote and help and like marry ourselves to the world, right? It's, what's it say? It says, what, why do you help wicked people and those that hate the Lord, right? And then what happens when we do that? God goes, uh-uh, no, you're promoting People who hate me, hate my name, right? And how many churches do that? You know, it makes me mad because a lot of ministries like, you know, I won't name any, but a lot of the majority of uh, ministries have their uh, retirement uh, programs in the stock market and they use spider funds, right? So they're investing into alcohol, tobacco, gambling, everything they preach against, they, they invest into for their retirement programs. And that's how they make money. Right. And so these pastors are going, no, you shouldn't do that. Adultery is wrong. You know, you shouldn't be a drunkard and gamble your life away. But they're going to get their retirement off the companies that produce that. Right. That's bad. That's wrong. So how much blessing do you think God is putting on their ministry when he sees them talking out of both sides of their mouth? Right. And I will specifically call out the Adventist church on that one because they their 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 uh, hospitals do abortions. Mm -hmm. So the church will sit there and preach against abortion. Some of the churches, but the conference is supporting churches. I mean, uh, hospitals that do abortions. And the reason why they do abortions is in order to be get uh, to get funding from the government. They have to provide a certain level of services or the insurance companies won't carry them as an option for the, the members to go to their hospitals. So they capitulate. They give in. They're like, okay, well, we got to do it. You know, and so we can't do the things the world does and say we're doing it for God. We can't partner with the world and say that we're being friendly to the world to win some. Well, here's the thing. If you're the salt and light, you're going to offend people. And if you're in a relationship with, say, a gay person and you haven't offended them with the truth ever, then come on then obviously that's not a happy relationship that god's gonna bless right you're just partnering with death and ignoring their need right and then then, then people call that love like i'm i'm being loving to you no letting someone burn in hell is not living right you don't sit there and ignore their sins like you can invest time but eventually you got to have that conversation like listen i love you enough to let you know you got to stop you know there's a day of judgment coming right okay 
How do you know if you're unequally yoked? John 15, 14 through 15. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master does. But I've called you friends. For all these things I've heard from my father, I have made them known to you. So, my little mark there. Are they friends with Jesus? Do they obey the Lord? Do you? Are you friends with Jesus? Are you obeying God? Are they obeying Jesus and love the Lord? That's how you tell if you're unequally yoked. If you're partnering with people, now, and we're not talking perfection. We're talking about people that really want to do something right for God, right? And that they're not perfect. They just know in their heart they need to be walking this direction. They might be going fast. They might be going slow. You know, we're not talking about that. We're talking about people that go like they're either in a rebellion. And you're like, yeah, I'm going to go out and club it and sleep with all the girls I like and steal from my company and that kind of stuff. And I don't care. And oh, I love the Lord, too. No, you know, stop being a liar. Right. I mean, you're faking it. Right. But if they're like, you know, I struggle with this. Or I have a problem with that. But I love God. I keep repenting. I keep my phone. Yeah, great. You're not unequally yoked because we're all that way. We all have things we're overcoming. Right. And so that's number one. Next one. Amos 3.3. 3. Can two walk together unless they have agreed? Do you both agree that the most important thing is to follow the Lord? Next one. Can you both accurately describe your relationship? The point of it and what it's based upon. Right. Like every one of our relationships in this room is based upon Christ. It's been the foundation. I might have a bad day. Bad day. You might have a bad day. You might have a bad day. But ultimately, our foundation is our own, is not our own perfection. It's our love for Christ and being part of the body of Christ. Right. So what we got either you're unequally yoked if they don't love the Lord and they're not willingly trying to be obedient to Him. Right. Don't call that person a friend because they're not. Because if they can't if they can't get out of rebellion against God, how are they going to get out of rebellion against you? Right. They're using you. That's what's happening. You're being used. Right. And that's fine that we all get used. The Bible says to be a servant to all men. So I let myself get used by people knowing that's what's happening. That's fine. I'm here to like be an influence in, in people's lives. Use me. OK. But I'm not confusing in my own heart that that's a friendship. Yeah. Right. And so, you know, and that's fine. But people that love the Lord, I, that's a fellowship. That's a friendship. That's just people that, you know, brass tacks. We're, we're good. OK. And so, um, next one, beware and flee from those who pervert the gospel. Okay. Colossians 1, 6 through 9. I am all rule that you so soon are being moved away from him who called you into the grace of Christ to another gospel, which is not another, but some are troubling you and desiring to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we are an angel from heaven, preach a gospel to you besides that which we preach to you, let him be accursed or anathema or Sent out to hell. As we said before, and now I say again, if anyone preaches the gospel besides what you have received, let him be accursed. I put on group me this week about how only 6% of Christians surveyed have a biblical worldview. 6%. Like Jesus Christ is sinless. He died for our sins. He's our Lord and Savior. He's the only one way to go to heaven. 6%. So that means 94% of all Christians aren't Christian. It's that simple. They're fakers. Because if you don't believe that Jesus Christ was sinless, then who died for your sin? Right? If you don't think Jesus is the only way to get to heaven, you're, then you're circumventing his sacrifice to make your own path. Okay. Right? What a joke. They don't believe in the holy power of the Holy Spirit. They think it was just a, an idea, like a thought, you know, like, you know, just a way of the expression, you know. So these are horrible, horrible things, right? So they're preaching another gospel. And so like most Protestant churches nowadays, if you go to their churches, they teach that Christians can go to heaven and Jews can go to heaven. Jews can go without Jesus because they're God's chosen people. <laughs> Where do you find that in scripture? That you can get any, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and life. No man, you know, but me, you know. So, okay, Jesus says he's the only way. You can't say, no, Jesus, you're wrong. There's another way, right? So these people pervert the gospel, right? And they're I mean, imagine if you guys sacrificed your loved ones or your spouse or your kids to save someone's life. And they're like, oh, I don't need that. Thanks. I got my own way. <laughs> I'm building my own ladder to heaven without your sacrifice. I mean, talk about the righteous indignation you would feel that God feels that those who reject his son. I mean, come on. Next one. Romans 16, 17 through 19. And I exhort you, brothers, to watch those making division or offense contrary to the doctrine you have learned and avoid them. For they who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own bellies. And by good words and fair speeches, they deceive the hearts of the simple. For your obedience reaches to all. Therefore, I am glad on your behalf. But I would have you truly wise as to good and simple toward uh, evil. So here's the thing. 
we have to be a light in the world, right? And so there's people that it, even within the fellowship and stuff like that, they don't believe everything we believe yet, but they're willing to be taught. They're willing to be coached and they're willing to be built up, right? Not a problem. Or he's not saying avoid those. He's saying avoid those people that are perverting the gospel, that are destroyed the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, that create their own path, right? These are the people that you want to get away from because they're the ones making the vision, right? So if I come to you and say, Angel, Jesus is the only way, right? And Joe Schmo sits here and goes, no, I think there's another way. Well, that's the vision because the Bible clearly says. So what we'd have to do is like, well, I'm sorry. If you're willing to stay and be taught and learn, that's fine. You hang out. But if you're going to keep on insisting that Jesus is not the only way, yeah, you have to go. I mean, right. Now you get some of the craziness that like some of us in this group have dealt with where people want to kick you out of their whole entire lives because you believe something slightly different than they do about Jesus. Well, that's wrong because the goal and intent is that you love Lord. You're trying to be obedient, right? And you're trying to walk that same path towards heaven. So you have to have room for those people, right? Where you'd let them go on their path, you know, because who's perfect? None of us are perfect. I'm not perfect, right? So if we don't allow people to walk a path, you know, and then kick and just immediately just kick them off the road as soon as they disagree with us, then that doesn't get anybody anywhere, right? So we have to allow them have the opportunity to, you know, repent. Okay, bottom of page two, 2 John 1, 9 through 11. Everyone transgressing and not abiding in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. Ugh. Okay. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ, he has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house, nor speaking or greeting to him. For he who speaks a greeting to him is partaker of his evil deeds. <laughs> right? And so if people come say they're coming in the name of the Lord, and they're here to share the truth of whatever, blah, 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 and you bless them, greet them, and let them into your house, and you entertain those lies, you're, you're a part of that evil. The Jesus says, nope, stop, right? Because they're bringing a curse into your house, right? Or into your relationship or into wherever you're at, right? We have to like, you know, build up this barrier and it's a spiritual barrier. And we have to remember, because remember we talked about like outside of your house is the outer court, you know, and then you get the inner court, your porch, and then you got the holies, which is your living room and your kitchen and your bedroom is the holies of holies. It's the most amount of intimacy in a relationship. It's the bedroom, right? And so when we let people into the holies, which is your house, you're allowing demonic activity into a place that's supposed to be sanctified. Right. That's why people, I don't just let anybody come to my house. Mm. You know, you ain't coming in. <laughs> you know, you have to earn that right to come into my house. Right. Because I understand the, the demonic presence that can be on people. So we just kind of keep that kind of stuff at bay. Okay. Top of page three. <clears throat> Second Thessalonians 3, 14 through 15. If any man does not obey our words in this letter, note that man, that you have no company with him to the end that he may be ashamed. Don't count him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Right? So what are you saying there? Listen, if they want to sit there and reject true biblical doctrine, that is easy to point out that Jesus is the only way. He's the sacrifice. We get the power of the Holy Spirit. Repent of your sins. And they want to say, well, I don't know. God says, okay, well, stop. Wait a minute. You know, we can't have this friendship that we're trying to have until we get on the board. Because what if we're unequally yoked, then they don't believe that they need to obey God. And why would you trust somebody like that? The maker of the entire the universe, you know, and they say, oh, we don't have to obey him. So what do makes you think that they're going to be a good friend? It's just not going to happen, right? It's No, it's not happening. And so we want people in our lives, friendships in our lives, the people that go, yes, obeying God in Jesus and repenting of our sin is the right way. Because listen, you're not always going to be able to see what they're doing. And you don't know if they're going to be stabbing in your back, stealing your stuff, lying about you. And so unless they walk around with some conviction of the Holy Spirit of right and wrong, you don't want that in your life, right? right? It's just time to say goodbye. We're done, you know? And so uh, next one, 1 Corinthians 5, 1 through 13. That's a little bit of a long one, but we'll get through it. So your, your own members are aware that there is sexual sin going on among them. This kind of sin is not even heard of among unbelievers, right? So this is the church having all kinds of sexual sin and adultery, okay? A man is actually married to his father's wife. You being ignorant when you should have been more upset about this. If you had been upset, the man who did this would have been removed from among you. So we're just saying people caught in sexual sin, get them out. Although I'm not physically present with you, I'm with you in spirit. 
I have already judged the man who did this as though I were present with you. When you have gathered together, I am with you in spirit. Then, in the name of the Lord Jesus and with his power, hand such a person over to Satan to destroy his corrupt nature so that his spiritual nature may be saved on the day of the Lord. That's tough. Mm -hmm. it's, not under for, uh, it's not good for you to brag. Don't you know that a little yeast spreads through the whole batch of dough? Remove the old yeast of sin that you have been a new batch of dough. Since you don't actually have the yeast of sin, Christ, our Passover land, has been sacrificed. So we must not celebrate our festival with the old yeast of sin or with the yeast uh, of rice and wickedness. In other words, saying, guys, listen, you've been free. Repent of these things we're talking about. Instead, we must celebrate it with the bread of purity and the truth that has no yeast. In my letter to you, I told you not to associate with people who continue to commit sexual sins. I didn't tell you that you, uh, you could not have a contact with others unbelievers who commit sexual sins or are greedy or dishonest or worship false idols. If that were the case, you would have to leave this world. Now, when I met was that you should not associate with people who call themselves brothers or sisters in Christ, Christian faith, but live in sexual sin, are greedy, worship false idols, or use abusive language, get drunk, or are dishonest. Don't even eat with such a person. After all, I do not, I, after all, do I have any business judging those who are outside the Christian faith? Isn't it your business to judge those who are inside? Right? So this is judge not, let's be judged. Paul's saying here, yes, you have to judge. You're not judging on their, if they're going to heaven or not, but you can judge their conduct, right? So, okay, keep going. God will judge those who are outside. Remove that wicked person from among you. So what is it saying? Let's look at the list. Are those sexual sin, greedy, worship false idols, use abusive language, get drunk or dishonest. Basically, people whose hearts aren't torn towards God. They don't feel remorse for what they're doing. They're just given to it. And they went, oh, I'm a Christian. You know, well, you might be, but you're way backslidden. You know, you're almost so far backslidden, you're falling off cliffs. So you want to stop that. Right? So this is contrary to, oh, just love people. Just get along. You know, be a passive influence. You know, I was like, no, he says, don't even mess around with it. Because what happens when they were on the day of Pentecost? They're all in one accord, correct? Mm -hmm. So, what happens, you know, Joanna? If we're sitting here, we're all one accord, and Mr. and Mrs. Adulterer, you know, thief murderer shows up and like, oh, yeah, let's pray. You know what? You know, an electronic circuit, right? Grinds through the line, it would end at that person. Right, short circuit, you know, and, and that's why you know this is so important. That's why Jesus went up to the upper room. That's why he went out to pray alone. That's why he took his disciples off because he was getting rid of the influence, the demonic burden around them, right? And they, you have to do that, you know. And so in our relationships, we have to do that, right? You know. And so the Bible says that that person don't treat him as like an enemy, but as a brother that's backslidden and fallen. And you just be honest with them, like, listen, you're messing up. We can't have a relationship until you get it right. It'll do one of two things. It'll save you a lot of time because it'll either get it right or leave, right? Or it'll convict them, right? And that they'll be like, oh, thank you. I got someone's looking out for me. And then you'll know that God's working in their heart. And, you know, you can go upon being friends again, right? But we don't want to fool ourselves to think these people are friends. But the problem is most people are so lonely and there's no, so little connection in the world anymore that they're willing to deal with that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. right? And we have to build ourselves up in Christ and let Christ be enough, let God be enough. And all the other beneficial uh, relationships we have, you know, as the extra that God gives us, right? Because we have to be willing to, like, put him first, even if that offends people that are, quote, unquote, friends, right? So they're not friends. Okay. The conduct of friendship. All right. Those are, that was our warning. So now we're going into how to be a good friend. Okay. Galatians 5, 13 through 15 at the bottom of page 3. Galatians 5, 13 through 15. For brothers, you were called by liberty, not... Uh, only do not use the liberty for opening to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, and even this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, take heed that you're not consumed by one another. All right, so what is this saying there, right? So we have been given liberty. Paul said all things are lawful, not all things are expedient. He says don't use that liberty you have to tear each other down, to rip each other apart, right? He says so that we should love one another, build each other up. Don't be like the reason why people go to bed crying at night and they have torn up spirits and souls because we're just constantly eating each other right okay top of page four galatians galatians 5 24 through 26 but those belonging to christ have crucified with the flesh with its passions and lust right 
So real quick, I'm going to just read that part. But those belonging to Christ have crucified the flesh with his passions and lust. That means you killed it. You made it commit suicide. You got it gone. You're smashing your 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 own selfish desires, right? The the that war against the spirit, the things that burden your 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 soul, right? So he says, Jesus did it. You got to do it, right? Now this is also contrary to the church of like, oh, grace, grace, grace. Listen, God loves you enough to save you from your sin, not just in your sin, right? He wants you to stop hurting yourself and do this destructive behavior, okay? I'll keep reading. It says, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become glory-seeking, provoking one another, and envying one another, right? And so we've done a lot on the hit list over the uh, brotherly love and the marriage and the parenting about, like, being good people that, you know, sacrifice our own desires and wants for each other, that build each other up, that take the hit, that carries the burden and does more than they really have to, right, to help other people along in life. That's what we have to be in our friendships, okay? Uh, next one, Ephesians 4, 30 through 32. And it says, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you are sealed until the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and tumult and evil speaking be put away from you and with all malice. And be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as a God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. Right? So what we got? Bitterness, wrath, anger, tumult, evil speaking be put away in malice. Right? So these are the things of the world. Right. This is how the world operates. You know, and we've all had these friendships and relationships that one day you're friends with somebody on your block and the next day they're talking bad about you. And then there's all this drama and, you know, and people are getting involved and, you know, all this just crazy wickedness. I hate that. I have no patience for drama. You know, I'm, not, I'm done with the drama in my life. If you want a drama, go away. <laughs> I'm not going to deal with the drama. Yeah. And so Jesus doesn't like that. God doesn't like it. And it's hard for the spirit to move in that. Mm -hmm. Right. Because they're, you're being moved by the demonic when that kind of stuff happens. And he says, listen, you want good friendship? Don't do that. Okay. Colossians 3, 14 through 16. This is, and above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfectness, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which you are also called into one body, and be thankful that the word of Christ will dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. There's like so much in that. So I'm going to go back over it. It says, but put on love, right? So what is love? Love is sacrificial. Love, love is outward focused, right? Love is not inward focused. We don't think about what we want, what we need. We think outwardly, right? And what this does is it inspires those people we do that for to eventually become that way. And that's what the devil doesn't want you to know is that if you do these things, you are investing into people's lives and one day they're going to turn around and do it back for you. So say you're one person and you live outwardly focused with love towards five people. Right. You're one trying to do it for five. One day, all five of those get it and they start doing it back to you. You put in the investment, you put in the time, you put in the effort. Now you have magnified five people taking care of you in a way you could never have done it yourself. Yeah. Right. And crowd knows this. Satan knows this. That's why he doesn't want you to do it. Right. And, and, and it's hard. It takes time. It takes effort. But in the long run, it's a better investment because now you have everybody looking after you and not just you trying to look after yourself. Right. And living in, in, in selfishness. And what's there? It's the at, let the peace of God rule in your hearts. Right. Tranquility. Be at be at calm. It doesn't mean you don't have problems with your stuff. It just means that strife and that anger and that backbiting. And you don't know if you could trust people and all this other stuff. And friend today, gone tomorrow type of relationships. You know, they're just pointless. Uh, what's the next one? Um, uh, boo, boo, boo. Be thankful. That's a good one. Right. Count your blessings, not your problems. Whatever you want to magnify, focus on it. If you're if there's a, a problem in your life and you're constantly focusing on it, you're giving it power, right? So what do you want? Whatever you want to magnify, focus on that. Be thankful for that. Talk to God about that. Stop using your heart, mind, spirit, and mouth to magnify your issues, right? We talked about that in marriage, that you don't do that. You have to sit there and pound that praise drum of all the good things. Right. And first of all, it helps you in your mind because you don't build up this giant wall. You can't get around. Right. But ultimately, it helps the people you're having relationships with. OK, uh, next one. Uh, the word of God, of Christ dwelling in your ritual. And I was and was that know the word, know the Bible, read your word. Right. Spend time with Christ. OK, 
Okay, easy. Now, this the other one's good, teaching and admonishing one another in, in music, basically, right? In other words, we can build each other up in song, in worship, you know, and that kind of stuff. See, th these are avenues we can uh, uh, build each other up. Okay, relationships that appear wrong should be avoided. First mm -hmm. Thessalonians 5, 17 through 22. It says, pray without ceasing and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophesying. Prove all things. Hold fast to that which is good. Abstain from every appearance of evil. Now, there's things in life that don't look, that aren't evil. They're not sin, but they can give an appearance of sin. Okay, okay. so we have to abstain from things that appear evil. Like me and um, Sarah, we work together. Right. And we wound up having to spend a lot of time together alone. But like we never went out to eat together. Right. And that kind of stuff. And anything that I ever did with Sarah, I always let my wife know. Right. And that way I have this covering. Right. And so we can have relationships, but we have to be very careful about like how we handle that relationship. Because why it doesn't appear evil, we know our hearts pure. Right. Outsiders are looking in and they will use any dumb, stupid excuse to come against you. Exactly. Right. And so we have to be very guarded about that because we already fight enough battles. We don't want to create more battles to fight. Right. We don't want to sit there and do this. Like, say, your neighbor that you help all the time fixing their stuff. If his wife's coming to your house and hanging out, you know, no, it doesn't matter what's going. It doesn't matter if you're walking in and she's giving you a recipe to cookies. You know, it's like, no, you got to leave, you know. And so um, I heard of a pastor. If I remember the story correct, he came and uh some single mom at the place invited him over to be kind, and they literally were making cookies. That pastor was gone. They said, you can't do that. Uh-uh. It don't matter what you're doing in there. Nobody knows. You're behind closed doors. You don't need to be there. Right. So what's more important, our friendships and relationships or our, our testimony before the world? And we have to be very careful with that. Right? And so... You have to pray. All of us have to pray, especially with me, because I talk to girls on the phone. My wife knows, but I minister to a lot of people. So she has to be aware of what's going on, what's going on. But I ain't going to their houses, you know, like they, if the, something's going on and they want to meet in a public place that we could do. But I ain't going to their houses. I ain't going in to pray with them. I ain't doing nothing. You know, it's like we can go sit in the middle of the road <laughs> and I'll pray with you out here. But I ain't going in your house, you know, because there's just too much. It takes one picture of me walking into a house, click, click, okay. you know, or me hugging somebody on a porch or something, you know, it's just it's not worth it. So we have to be very guarded. And a lot of pastors like I had a pastor and he if confessed in front of the church. Uh, his name was Robbie. And uh, uh, he was helping a woman go see her husband at prison. And that's what he did. He went and picked her up. Took him, took her to prison to go see her husband. Gave her at home. Walked inside and wound up having adultery with her. Mm -hmm. You're right. It took that long. He said he walked inside just for a second, say goodbye, and things turns out horribly fast. And he gave in. Right. I mean, it, it doesn't take. I mean, people are like, oh, that will never happen. No, I ain't dumb enough to think that'll never happen. <laughs> I'm a dude. I understand. You gotta, have, you know, put that wall up and not even give the devil place. Right. And don't play games. OK. And oh, real on the appearance of evil, too. It's not just relationships. It's about like how we can uh, conduct ourselves, how we look, how we interact, mm -hmm. anything that looks like contrary, mm -hmm. you know, or even like if you're at work and you're handling money and you, oh, I'm going to go, uh, you know, you bring it with you, push to bring the bank, but you decide to go stop and get lunch first. Mm -hmm. That's an appearance. No, you go straight to the bank, then you get lunch, that kind of stuff where you always do things as just and righteously as humanly possible. Mm -hmm. And that way nobody has any kind of shadow of over you mm -hmm. so your testimony doesn't get hurt mm -hmm. right because that's the most important thing right and how we interact with Christ. next one ephesians 5 11 and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness but rather reprove them right in other words don't don't try to play along don't get along don't do anything it's like football right that's a that's a work of darkness now in the nfl because the nfl's gay and i'm like well I'm, I'm done watching the nfl I ain't even going to support you. I'm not going to help get your revenue by watching your show and you get money from the commercials. We're done. It's easy. I don't need your entertainment. I have to do other things, you know, more productive things, to be honest, you know. But the, most Christians are like, oh, I just ignore it. Mm -hmm. What was it? Yeah. yeah. I go to the movie theaters. Oh, they swear once in a while. There's a scene I don't need to see. Man, that boils me. <laughs> right. I'll just close my eyes. Oh, it's over. Okay. <laughs> you know, you still give them your money. It's like what Netflix and all the pedophilia stuff on there. Mm -hmm. I would never pay for Netflix or Disney. It's like, cause the one good, two or three good things that you like, 
you're actually funding all the things the devil preaches. I um, mean, the God, devil's promoting, God preaches against. You know, and so we have to be weary and wary, especially entertainment. It's such a hard one. We live in an entertainment culture. We always want to be entertained. We entertain ourselves to death. We're like the Romans, breads and circuses. Now it's internet, and Netflix. You know, and so movies. All right, and so the devil knows how to get us because one, if he gets us to laugh at it, we'll accept it, right? And so he. That's why you see like an Andy Griffith and all that stuff. They start showing cross dressers all these old black and white shows you'll see men acting like ladies and everybody's like ah oh, and they were way over the top with it right well that was to put it into the culture get people accepting it slowly oh we'll laugh at it and if you look as it goes to the 50s 60s 70s 80s it gets worse and worse and worse and now look where we're at you can't watch a television show without a gay commercial yeah. you know people kissing each other right and so this is the things that if you're hanging around people, right, and they're okay with it, then you need to put up a barrier. Because, listen, if they're not spiritually discerned enough to know what's spiritually good and spiritually bad, you know, and they don't want to hear you talk about it, then how's that a relationship? It's not a biblical relationship. It's not one that you need to invest into, mm -hmm. right? That doesn't mean you can't counsel them and pray for them, that kind of stuff, and still be an influence as a brother or sister in Christ. But don't sit there and hang your hat on that relationship, you know, you need to just keep on moving on because listen, if you're going to go with the Lord Jesus Christ, you're going to go where most people don't go. What do you say? Many are called, few are chosen. Narrow is the path that leads to destruction. Uh, wide is the path that leads to destruction. Narrow is the path that leads to life, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that means that if you're walking this, you're not walking with a lot of people, right? You're walking a path mostly alone. And then God blesses us like he's in this group, allowing us to find people that will walk it with us. Praise God, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. You know, because most of the world's not. And if 94 or 96% or 94% of the uh, Christians that surveyed don't have a biblical worldview, they're all burning in hell. I mean, it's, just, it's, that, it's that simple. You know, either Jesus is it or he's not. It's, that's, the, that's the ticket, you know. And so we have to be very careful. Okay. First Timothy 5, 22. Do not, I love this one. This is a great one. I do not lay hands quickly on anyone. Let me pray for you, brother. What? Amen. Yeah. Neither be partakers of their sins of others. Keep yourself pure. Do not pray for those in rebellion or promote them to an office in the church. Oh, it's a good one. How many times do they do that in church? They'll pray for anybody. I'm going to lay hands on you. How many pastors just walking around slapping everybody? I'm like, you, what? Mm -hmm. Talking about throwing, you know, the children's bread to the dogs or catching your pearls before swine. Mm -hmm. yep. They need to be vetted. Like, you know, like one street minister, what they did is uh, always led people through a prayer of repentance. That's great. You can get them to pray repentance and ask God to forgive their sins, lay hands on, pray for them. And that's what I try to do now. You know, but like if you're just walking around, I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray for you. Be healed. Be healed. Dude, stop wasting your time. You're an insult, really, to the body of Christ, the power of the Holy Spirit, right? And so you're asking God to bless somebody in complete and total rebellion who doesn't want to stop just so they can get a warm fuzzy from you praying for them, right? And the Bible clearly says, don't lay hands quickly on anyone. It clearly says that. Don't pray for those who are rebellion or promote them to an office in the church. How many people, how many churches do that? Oh, we need a warm body. Would you want to take a position? Okay, and you, now and you. And, you know, and that's why the churches don't have power because they're so deluded spiritually. Because what we talked about, they're all in one accord in the upper room, right? And then you get a church that's broken down and half of them are backslidden and sin and, you know, pornography and all these other things, and they can't get nothing right. And then they're easy prey because there's no hedge of protection spiritually because there's too it's like swiss cheese <laughs> you know there's too many holes right all right the benefits of friends that's a whole lot of what to look out for how to warn and stuff so now we're moving into the easy stuff all right proverbs 27 17 iron sharpens iron so a man sharpens the countenance of his friends right in other words that's what friends friends are do most people think friendship is just oh we're always going to get along we're never going to have any kind of like debate we're never going to like challenge each other we're yeah, exactly. We're there to challenge each other. We're there to build each other up. We're there to point out some things. Because my life miserable at times. Yeah, right. And so, like, how how can you how can you sharpen a knife without friction? Exactly. Right. And and that's what he talks about. It makes the the counts of friends shiny, right? And so, 
we we do that in a myriad of ways. So we can build each other, pray with each other, invest in each other, challenge each other when one of us is feeling like, what are you doing? You know? And so that's what we're supposed to be doing, right? Conflict is not always bad. Confrontation is not always bad. You know, the world teaches you all conflict, avoid it all. You accept everything and avoid conflict. It makes no sense. What did Jesus do? His life was conflict. You know, he wasn't around giving everybody warm fuzzies and making everybody happy. I mean, John the Baptist, too, white wall sepulchers, bro to vipers you're jesus is like you're uh, you're a child of hell if abraham is your father yeah i mean think about that this is not friendly stuff you know and so w- conflict is not bad so if we see a brother or sister in christ it's our duty to be like hey mm, what are you doing i mean you gotta stop that you're backsliding i love you but stop right and then uh, god will bless us for that proverbs 17 17 a friend loves at all time and as a brother is born of for the time of trouble right and so as a friend our love isn't supposed to be conditional, right? We're not like, if it's true biblical friendship, we're not going to put like, okay, that's enough. We're done, right? We're done here. You cross this line, we're done, right? Because if they're truly as a child of Christ trying to get it right, they might be struggling. They might be backsliding, but they have a repentant heart. Then we just keep forgiving, right? And I mean, outside of them, you know, trying to ruin our marriages or something like that, you know, you have to like, you know, be forgiving and loving, be like Christ. Always try to present the Christ-like character towards people because they need it. We all need it. Okay. Uh, Proverbs 27, 9. Ointment and perfume rejoice the heart. So the sweetness of a man's friend by hearty counsel. Right. And so that I love that verse because here's the thing. We're there to help each other out, to give each other wisdom, to see a, a point of view the other person doesn't see, to point out the things that they might be overlooking or can't see. Right. And so that's the hearty counsel. Right. And so we need to understand, uh, uh, we're about to flip on the page five here in a second, that like as friends, it's not always pleasant. It's not always easy. You're going to say the hard things. Like I was a friend to a person that was a Christian and he didn't like me because I kept pointing out the facts, but he needed to know because he was having self-destructive behavior. And so, uh, uh, and eventually he fired me, but uh, <laughs> he didn't like it. No, uh, but he didn't realize I was actually being a true friend. He had a bunch of yes men around him and his company was failing. Everything was failing. And I was sitting there going, no, this is what's going on. This is what we need to change. This is what we do. And of course he didn't like it. And so he's like, bye-bye, you know? So I did the right thing though, because he needed to know the truth, you know, and all those other people lying to him and getting, you know, just milking him for his money. You know, all right. Top of page five. Proverbs 27, five through six. An open rebuke is better than secret love. A faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of the enemy are deceitful. Right. So we just talked about that, that sometimes there's conflict. Sometimes people backslide. A true friend will not let you do things that are going to destroy your life. Right. You, you like we all I know I have grown up with potheads and, and doing drugs and stuff. They come to your house. They don't care about you. They're just trying to find a place to do drugs. Mm-hmm. And they'll get up and leave. They don't care if you're about to just slit your own, slit your own wrist or throat or kill yourself. They don't care. They're just mm-hmm. like I just got done helping somebody the other day where he said he used to have 30, uh, 20 to 30 people, meth heads, come to his house every single day, you know, and do meth with him and stuff, steal his stuff. And then when he needed help, not one of them would help him. Mm-hmm. And they were just using him for his house and a place to get high. Mm-hmm. Right. And that's what that is. Right. And so an open rebuke is better than secret love. We can say we love each other and I love you and blah, blah, blah. But if I'm watching any of y'all destroy yourself and I do nothing to help stop it, mm-hmm. I don't love you. And you're responsible for it. Right, exactly. And so the church calls it love. Oh, just love. Love wins. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) You know, and so the church is like, oh, you just got to love people. Well, what's love? Right. So it's not like, Adam, if you want to sit there and hit yourself in the hammer and you think, this is fun. I really enjoy this, Lance. (laughs) And you're like bleeding down your face, you know. And I'm like, oh, I just love you, Adam. Go right ahead. (laughs) You know, that's not love, right? (laughs) Love would be to rip the hammer out of your head and take you to the hospital, right? And tell you, Adam, you're being a moron. You know, stop this. Yeah, you know, <laughs> this is hurting you. It's a, uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> Busted them. And so, you know, that's love. And so if people kind of indulge your homosexuality or anything, drug use and stuff, and you don't say, listen, you're destroying yourself. That's love. Mm -hmm. But here's the thing. They call it love because it takes the pressure off. Mm -hmm. If I'm not actually responsible for you and I have to do nothing to you, I get a warm fuzzy because I'm accepting whatever you want to do. And I have no responsibility over anything in your life. You just do what you like. 
right? And so it's basically pushing responsibility off, right? Mm -hmm. True friends don't do that. True friends will take a responsibility that's not their own and make it their own to get help for the person they love, right? Mm -hmm. That's that's friendship. That's true biblical friendship. Okay. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 12. Two people are better than one. This is what we read up, up top, but I wanted to put it in here again. Two people are better than one because they together they have a good reward for their hard work. If one falls, the other can help his friend get up. But how tragic it is for the one who is all alone when he falls. There is no one to help him get up again. If two people lie down together, they can keep warm. But how can one person keep warm? Though one person may be overpowered by another, two people can resist one opponent. A triple braided rope is not easy broken right so what's this thing i love this because if you really look at this what is he ex explaining here adversity trials tribulations problems i mean they're cold they got attacked the one got crumbled right so what are you saying a a, a, like we just read a brother's born for adversities right and so he's explaining that listen life gets hard we all need help that's what friends are for biblical friends godly friends right and so when life gets hard you know, we have somebody to help help us out and somebody to lean and fall back on other than us because sometimes we can't do it ourselves, right? Good times. Okay. Your responsibility towards your friends. Mark 5, 19. However, Jesus did not allow him, but said to him, go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and has had mercy on you. Right? So what are we supposed to do with our friends? We're supposed to tell them about God, Christ, Jesus, salvation, the things that is happening in our lives. True friendships, we'll talk about Christ a lot. Right? Because is there anything better? I don't know. Right? If you have friendships and God and Jesus never come up, they're not a friend. I'm not, I'm just telling you, it's not a friend. Right? Because true friendships based upon God, Christ, Jesus, Lord, right? That's a true friend, right? Because listen, if I know where to get a million dollars and I'm filthy, stinking rich, and I know you're dirt poor, you're dirt poor or something, and I don't tell you, hey, Adam, you go right over here, you get a million dollars, you can be rich yourself, right? Or Cody, go right there, right? And I just keep it to myself. I'm a selfish turd, <laughs> right? And I'm like, you know, keeping the good news to all myself, right? And so that's not what friends do. If I really found a good thing, if I really believe it to be true, accurate, and honest, I want to tell you about it. I want you to have what I have, mm -hmm. right? And, and so, and it, I, like I've told you guys this before, but I used to work at a gym, and uh, I had a friend that was Christian, and there was another person I gave a gospel track to who turned out to be a Christian. And I was like, yeah, I'll just talk to him about God and Jesus. And, and this friend, who's been friends with this guy for seven years, said, yeah, I'm a Christian too. And this guy goes, you're a Christian? And he's like, yeah. And he goes, I'm a Christian too. They known each other for seven years, and neither of them knew that they were Christians. That's horrible. Boom! I was like, yeah, you're kidding me, guys. <laughs> What's going on here? All right, next one. Third John one fourteen. But I trust I shall shortly see you and shall speak face to face. Peace be unto you. The friends greet you. Greet thy friends by name. Right. So that's a simple one, but it's nice to be reaffirmed when we see people like you know I come here and Daniel always goes, hey brother Lance, you know, or call people by name and and, and reaffirm them, you know, as much as we can. I try to do that. I don't always remember to do it, but it's something I try to keep in my mind. You know, it's like hi Angel, hi John, hi Adam. You know. It's simple, but it's it's reaffirming. Mm -hmm. You know, you see me, you understand me, you're paying attention to me. I'm important enough to you to greet, you know, and so that's why I come in, give you hugs and, you know, all that kind of stuff. I do it every time I come home. I kiss my kids or touch their head and kiss the wife, you know, and let them know, hey, I see you, you know, how you doing? You know, I'm here and I just come in like a ghost in the night and ignore everybody and walk straight to the back room. And, you know, you don't want to do that. You know, especially when you're walking into people's presence, and especially if you're married, you want to acknowledge each other, right? It's very important, okay? John 15, 12 through 13. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends, right? So what's the goal of friendship, guys? It's to lay your life down for each other. You know, it's my goal to lay my life down for you. Hopefully, it's your goal to lay down for me, right? And so we have to do this. Right. And that's we can emulate or, or, or be like Christ for each other. But again, the devil doesn't want us to do this. He wants us to be selfish because he knows if you get a group of 10 people all willing to die for each other and sacrifice and give for each other. Man, how much better off are they? They're rich now. Mm -hmm. Now magnify. You get a thousand people doing that. Oh, my God. What can you do with a thousand people that are living sacrificially? I mean, I'm, I'm, it boggles the mind. The apostles found out in the book of Acts when they had like 5,000 new converts and okay. everybody sold their stuff and put it in one big giant pot and go, let's spread some gospel, people. You know, and so it's a beautiful thing. All right, Hebrews 10, 24 through 25. It says, 
Let us consider one another to provoke to love, right? So we should be provoking. How do you provoke someone to love? By being loving, right? Showing the example. Be, let them know what it looks like. That's how you provoke people to love, okay? Um, uh, and to do good works. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. That means get together and, you know, do this. As the manner of some is by exhorting one another. And so much more as you see the day approaching, you are meant to call them near to God, right? And so... We provoke by setting an example. We assemble together by worshiping, praying, getting together, doing Bible studies, right? Uh, you know, and I love this. And the manner of some is at the time they thought Jesus was coming back so soon, people just went out and hid. They were like, oh, Jesus is coming back. I'm just going to hide somewhere, right? I am very, I could do this. <laughs> I could just go hide in the mountains and be happy. <laughs> but that's not how you love people. You know, it's hard to love a tree. Oh, I love you, tree. Be like a tree hugging hippie. <laughs> Yeah, we talk. Okay, bears, line up. We're gonna talk about the gospel today. It just doesn't work, you know. <laughs> you preach the gospel to all I, I, you know, I've taken that literally and done it to all my animals. Oh my I'm not joking. I've done mine too. Uh, yeah. Lay hands on, pray for them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'm like God. I don't know how this all works, but I want this one in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then next dog, and that one, and then I I, I won't claim all the dogs. I'll just claim my own. <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm convinced people won't have things in heaven because they don't ask for them now, and so I ask for things. I'm like, okay, God, I want this, I want that, and so when I get there, I'll I have all the stuff I asked for, you know. And a lot of people are going to be like. Why, why are you getting all that? I was like, I asked. I don't know about you. I took it serious. He said, store up in heaven, your church. I was like, okay, this is what I want. You know? And so, like, I'll just be honest. Maybe you want one of these too. I told God I wanted a black horse that when you looked at it, it looked like the stars of the sky. And then it walked. It left fiery footprints. That's what I want. So when I get there, yes. So I'm confident it's there. I'm going to get it. Ask for one for yourself. <laughs> then I won't be alone riding my awesome horse. My uh, Ariana picked one. <laughs> yeah, I told her, she's like, yes, I want this. So, of course, there's a rainbow and pretty and stuff. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like I want mine powerful. <laughs> you know? And so people, you know, they just don't think that way, that, like, heaven's a real place, that God wants to give you good gifts, and that he won't deny anything good thing from you, you know? Well, in heaven, all things will be good, you know? So, you know, tell God what you want. This is what I want. And I told him, I was like, I would love to move to the forest and the trees, so I want a house on the new heavens, new earth that's out in the forest and the trees, you know? I'll teleport into town or whatever, but <laughs> ride my awesome horse, <laughs> you know? for a place in the forest too. I have this vision in my head of the kind of house I want. You're right. Because I don't really want to be inside. I want to be outside more than anything. Or right. Whatever kind of nature is existing in. Right. Then I said, if you have a city, I don't mind high rise either. So I could look down and see all the beautiful jewels glowing. Right. Gold, you know, I'm, I'm good for that. And then I asked it to be chaos. So <laughs> <laughs> Melissa will be right there with you. <laughs> <laughs> Me. Uh, right, that's awesome. All right, First Thessalonians five eleven. Therefore, comfort one another and edify one another, even as you uh, also do. Edify means to build up as you do a house, right? So to build each other up, edify, encourage, talk about God, you know, pray, and you know, do the things that inspire people to want to know God more, mm -hmm. right? Okay, Colossians three twelve through fourteen. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender feelings of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long suffering, forbearing with another, forgiving yourselves. If anyone has complained against any, as Christ forgave you, so also you do. And above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfectness. And for a uh, perfection, a uh, perfectness. There you go. Forbear means to put up with. Okay. Mm -hmm. That means sometimes you just have to put up with people. Sometimes people act like fools. You know, and morons, and do, do say and do dumb, stupid things, right? What does the Bible say? Well, just deal with it. Let it go. Everybody has a day. I've had my day. I'm sure you guys will have days too, right? That we just have to just deal with it. Just look past it and go, well, eh, it's not the, you know, because we all have like, you know, if this is our life and it's a nice flat line, and then someone has the, one of those days you have to forbear with as a speed bump, you know, it's not going to be that way forever, right? Right. Uh, so it's like you just have to deal with it. You look past some stupid stuff and some offenses and you forgive and you let it go, right? Because you look back, yesterday's already gone and it's like, well, I handled that really bad. I could have done better. I could have just shut my mouth and not said a word or something. <laughs> right. Because then the consequences are still there from saying something stupid from yesterday. Right. It's hard to undo. Yeah, it is. Right. It's, no, go ahead. Okay, no. Oh, no, you're right. And so we just have to, you know. 
wink at stuff. And the Bible talks about how God winks at sin sometimes, you know, like in the Old Testament, where he'd wink at it and just kind of, all right, guys, <laughs> you know, stop this. <laughs> he, he went blink so much he went blind. He's like, okay, I guess he's thing. But uh, you know, right, right. And so we just have to deal with it. You know, nobody's perfect, and we all have bad days. You know, and you just kind of deal with it and know that the the true core of that person or individual group of people is good. That you've already vetted them. They love the Lord. They want to obey God. They have repented of their sins. Because none of us are perfect. Okay, so we don't want to put that like you got to be perfect or I can't be your friend. You got to be perfect. Me or Lord forbid. <laughs> right. All right. Top of page six. Romans twelve nine through ten. Be sincere in your love for others. Hate everything that is evil. Wow. Mm -hmm. So if we watch television shows that have magic and pornography in them, uh, murder, death, and all these things, we're not supposed to be entertained by those. I and mean, if our friends are into those things, we're not supposed to be associating, okay? Because what it says, it doesn't say deal with. It says hate. Hate. Hate, 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 hate. They're like, no, I ain't doing that. I'm tired of it. Okay? And hold tight to everything that is good. That means get ham-fisted with it. Like, you ain't taking this from me. Right? Mm -hmm. All right. Love each other as brothers and sisters honor others more than you do yourself. We are to prefer for each other over ourselves. Right? And so, basically, hate sin. Hate the devil. Hate all these things in the world that the modern church tells you just to deal with and they ignore and they don't talk about. The Bible doesn't say just put up with it. He says hate it. You know, you don't have to, and especially when you're like, you can't find a company that you can buy, buy goods for that you don't know what they're investing your money if you buy there. But entertainment is one of the simplest, easiest things to walk away from. We don't have to be entertained, right? We don't have to have television on 24 7 hours a day, you know, feeding us garbage that God tells us to avoid and stuff. So we have to be very careful. There's some things that are so easily taken out of our lives that really won't affect us, it, you know, oh, I missed the newest movie. Okay, you missed the new movie. Nope. End of the world. Guess what? You don't remember half of the newest movies you saw a year ago, right? And you just moved on. You got entertained for two hours. You called it a good time and you forgot about it. And all it did is take something from your soul. It's the best either. Right. Exactly. And so there's certain things, certain relationships are easy to walk away from, easy to cut off as we hate sin. Now, we can love sinners, but we hate sin and we just don't deal with it. We don't put up with it. We're like, no, I'm done. I'm done. We're, we're just done with that. Okay. John 13, 34 to 35. I give you a new commandment that you love one another. He said, I have loved you. You should also love one another. By this, uh, all shall know that you are my disciples if you have love towards one another. Right. So what is the, the defining act that the world is supposed to see between us and them? It's our love for each other. Man, look how they take care of each other. Look how they love each other. Look how the Christians are always taking care of one another and always have each other's back. You never see a Christian fall. That, that That's what's supposed to be saying without all the other Christians coming. Now, the church is as dumb as a box of rocks now because they'll go out and try to evangelize a world and ignore the hurt in their own building. Mm -hmm. Right? They'll let an old lady or a single mom with kids pay tithe. Right? to the church and then turn around that tithe money to do an outreach to a bunch of people who won't even accept Jesus and call it outreach by getting free backpacks and stupid stuff like this. <laughs> that is so stupid. If your church and your body isn't helping taking care of those in need, what a bait and switch. Hey, you should accept Jesus. Come and join our church. Well, yeah, we all love each other. Oh, you accept it. We're going to ignore you now and we're going to go find somebody else, but you should keep paying us money. But we're going to ignore you and go find other people to love on besides you. That's dumb, right? It's not even biblical. And they do it to elderly people, too. How dumb is that? It, it's super. It's a sin, right? And so that is not Christianity. Christianity is taking your own. The defining act over the body of Christ is that we love one each other. We take care of each other. We have each other's backs. Wait, and like the Bible says, prefer one another, right? Before even the world. We have to prefer each other. So, Cody, if you can't eat and Joe Schmo down the street who doesn't love God or Jesus can't eat, and I take that money, I feed that dude, I sound, I've sinned against you. I've sinned against God, right? Obviously. Now, right now, if I help you and have a little extra, I could help the unbeliever. That's fine. Right? But if I'm not helping the body of Christ, how are we loving each other? It makes no absolute sense. And so we don't do that. Okay. Um, how is this accomplished? Galatians 6.2, bear one another's burdens so you will fulfill the law of Christ. So we just talked about, right? Bearing each other's burdens, building each other up, taking care of one of each other, right? It's just like uh, Adam and Cody, you helped fix the fence today. That was a burden or yesterday uh, for Angel and Daniel and something that needed to be taken care of. Yes, it was. Boom. Fulfillment of loving the body of Christ, right? 
Also, this week we did uh, encouraging text on group media for everybody. That is fulfilling law, law of Christ. We're building each other up, talking about the good things, what we appreciate about one another, right? That's fulfilling the law of Christ, right? Many of you guys have helped me and my family in this ministry. That's fulfilling the law of Christ. This is what God wants us to do, right? And what does that do? It makes us all stronger, right? And so one of us can't do it all alone, but all of us together can get it done, right? All right, 1 John 5, 2 through 3. By this we know that we love the children of God whenever we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. It goes back to the, how do you know if you're unequally loved? What it says, this is how we know we love the children of God whenever we love God and keep his commandments. You cannot tell me you love me unless you're being obedient to Christ. Right. You're a liar, right. right? So unless you're keeping the commandments, you're in, you're in rebellion, you're lying to me, you're lying to God, you're lying to yourself. I'm not right there. I should tell you. You keep the Sabbath. Right. No matter how you want to do other things, so you keep it. Because that's what I struggle with. Too. Right. Right. And people have growth periods. We can't beat people with hammers and they learn new things. And, you know, it took you, you know, you learn for a while and everybody in this group learned for a while. But the the intent was there. They're like, okay, I will learn. Now, it doesn't mean they're there overnight, you know, but we give people time to grow and let God work on their hearts. But if they're just like, no, no, ain't nothing, you know, and they just walk away and there's no stirring of their spirit. Well, then how are you going to love me? You can't. It's impossible. Right. That's what the Bible clearly says. All okay. right. How to keep your friends. Yeah, here at the end here. Pay them off. <laughs> Give them large sums of money. <laughs> right, right. Give them warm fuzzies. Uh, Hebrews 12, 14. Try to live peacefully with everyone, right? And try to live holy life because if you don't, you will not see the Lord, right? So how do you keep your friends? Try to live at peace. Overlook an offense, right? And live a holy life. Do that pleases God. Overlook an offense, a failure. Let it go. You don't have to like, you know, keep smashing people because they mess up. You know, you just look past it and move forward and look to the good things. Right. Next one. Romans 12, 18. If it is possible, Matt, as much as is up to you, be at peace with all men. Right. We're seeing a trend. Right. Peace. Right. In other words, don't give in to strife. Don't give in to an offense. Don't give in to things that rub you just the wrong way. You know, I heard a pastor once call it sandpaper people. Like if you get rubbed the wrong way, they're taking an edge off you, you know, that you need removed so you won't take offense to it, right? And then that God allows those people in your life to teach you how to overcome those feelings and emotions and look past it and move on, right? All right, Ephesians 4, 26 through 27. Be angry and do not sin. Did it say not? don't be angry? It doesn't say don't be angry. It says be angry and don't sin. So you can be angry. God gave us our emotions, right? Anger is not a bad thing. It's what you do with it. Don't let the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. This is important for friends, family, kids. Don't go to bed angry. Don't let something carry on to the next day that can be fixed tonight if possible, you know, especially with your friends and stuff. You don't want to build that barrier or that hurt, you know, and then give the devil a whole 24-hour period to, you know, see discord and strife into your relationships, you know. And so, okay. I find out it's like you're when you get angry at somebody like that, and you let it go for a night. The next day, you're kind of getting numb to it, and you start building a grudge. Right. And that grudge is so much harder to get rid of. Right. Than saying, okay, look, I screwed up. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we have to bite the bullet and take the blame. Right. Right. Hardest thing. To do. <laughs> right. It's not it's fun. So much better to get rid of all that. It's so much better when you're at fault, not me. <laughs> <laughs> Your fault, but I don't <laughs> right, right. All right. <laughs> Proverbs 6, 1, 2, 3. My sons, if you are if you are surety for your friend, if you struck your palms with a stranger, you are, you are snared with the words of your mouth. You are taken with the words of your mouth. My son, do this now and deliver yourself when you have come into the hands of your friends. Go and humble yourself and make your friends sure. In other words, if you have conflict, if you have problems and you know you messed up, it's your responsibility to get there fast. Don't wait. Don't delay. Make it right. Right. Get in there and say, listen, I messed up. Please forgive me. I don't want this between us. That kind of stuff. It doesn't say wait a week, pray about it, repent and make all these dumb excuses. When what it says, if you go before the Lord and have offense against your brother, leave your gift, go get right with your brother, then come back. Mm -hmm. You know, so you have to get right with those people in your life that you have problems with. If right. is up top verse, as much as it's possible for you, some people won't let you. I have a relationship in my life that they're like, I will never forgive you. Mm -hmm. Well, how do you work with it? You can't. Well, I forgive you. Have a good day. <laughs> you know, move on. Right. Mm -hmm. So, all right. Yeah. 
Proverbs 17, 9. I put this two different ways because I like both. You will keep your friends if you forgive them, but you will lose your friends if you keep talking about what they did wrong. And the other way, he who covers his transgression seeks love, but he who repeats a matter separates friends. All right? So if like so-and-so did something to you, you don't just keep bringing it up. Hey, you remember when you messed me over the other day? Next day. Yeah, I'm still thinking about when you messed me over, you know, and you just keep talking about it or bring it up or periodically every two weeks you remind them of their failure. You're not going to have friends that way. Right, right. What do you mean? What did you do? And this is big in marriages, you know, and then with parenting kids and stuff. Right. And so like for me, when I was overcoming lust, you know, and I'd feel so bad about it and I'd pray to God and I'd be like, oh, God, you know, uh, please forgive me. I did it again. And I felt like I was saying, did what again? Mm hmm. Because exactly. he already forgot. And that's how we're supposed to treat each other. Right. For him, in his point of view, he already forgave me, blessed me, and helped me move on in life, right? And it was X'd out. So that next time was the first time to him. He was like, okay, what do you, you know, I don't know what you're talking about, but I forgive you, <laughs> you know? And so in relationships, it's really hard, especially marriage and with children, or if there's a repeated offense, mm -hmm. that it just becomes ingrained, you know? And so we have to just break it and be like Jesus, cast it to the ocean and, you know, forget it. It ever happened and not leave it like hovering because a lot of times in, in relationships if people try to grow in christ their their spouse or their children won't let them change like they will continuously hold them back because they remember all the bad stuff mm -hmm. and that's not biblical that's not christian it's not what god has called us to right we have to forget that stuff so they can change and so they can become better you know and one of the guys i helped the other day it's what he was dealing with that he, he used to be drugs and all this other stuff and he says everybody knows me everywhere i go as these things and nobody will let it go and they won't let me live past it it's horrible no it's horrible and so, so he was telling me he wants to move to another mm -hmm. part of the state or something just to get away from everybody right and so he's thinking about going to a homeless shelter in august from salvation army and you do a 60-day program with them and then they'll help you get away from it all uh i don't know exactly 40 50 is a little older Oh, yeah, that might be worth it. Mm -hmm. I was looking to it. But, you know, and then, so it's sad that so we can't do that. And so if your spouse used to do something or your children used to something and they're trying to get it better, let them get it better. Don't be the the barrier, the stumbling block that doesn't allow them to keep growing, mm -hmm. you know, and or to change, you know, because you have held that hurt so long that you don't want to let it up, you know. All right. Uh, top of page seven as we close out here. Proverbs seventeen fourteen. There we go. A friend's loud. <laughs> I put this one because it made me laugh. A friend's loud blessing in the early in the morning would be thought of as a curse. <laughs> so don't go to a friend's house when it's early. <laughs> yeah, 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 you know, I just thought it was hilarious. Good, good sound advice. You know, not really practical in our day and age because we call people now. So we'll put, don't call your friend early in the morning. <laughs> you know, <laughs> don't wake them up with the phone call unless it's an emergency. Okay. Uh, next one. Matthew 5, 38 through 42. You have heard it and it says, an eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. But I say you do not resist evil. Uh, but whoever shall strike you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. And to him desiring to sue you and take away your tunic, let him have your coat also. And whoever shall compel you to go a mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks you, and you should not turn away from him who would borrow from you. Okay, so how much more for our friends, right? If they have need, if they need something, they need our help, they need assistance, they need something. Mm -hmm. How much more? So this is Jesus talking about dealing with the world, mm -hmm. not with the believer. How much more so for the believer, you know? Mm -hmm. And so if they need, you give, mm -hmm. you know? And so often we're like, well, is it going to cost me? Is it going to work out? I don't have to do it. I don't have the time. You know, all this ridiculousness we put up in our minds because we exalt ourselves so highly in our own opinion that like it doesn't allow us to do things for other people. Right. But that's the life of a Christian is to be a servant. Right. Not to always be getting our own, doing our own thing. It's to help people and facilitate their lives to love God. Right. And again, in time, they'll start doing it too. And then you'll get your needs met. Right. But you have to be willing to invest that time and that effort. OK. First uh, Peter three, nine through eleven. Don't pay people back with evil for the evil they do to you or ridicule those who ridicule you. you. Instead, bless them because you were called to inherit a blessing. People who want to live a full life and enjoy good days must keep their tongues from saying evil things and their lips from uh, speaking deceitful things. They must turn away from evil and to do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. Right. So watch what you say. Watch how you act. 
try to be at peace with everyone. I had an occasion the other night where I was I was all geared up to have a, a confrontation with my neighbor because their black dog keeps coming to my yard, and I had and uh, he was in my yard when Cody got there. And uh, he started growling and barking at me and stuff. And I was like, get her, get her. So I walked outside and uh, shot my firearm, not at him, but at the, at the ground in front of me to startle the dog to get him to run off to let him know you can't sit and come to my yard, especially I have little children. Mm-hmm. you know. So at this point, okay, we're past the point of trying to get along with people. Your dog is endangering me, endangering the, my children. It's already been in my yard and done a bunch of stuff. And so I'm like, okay. At this point, there's going to be conflict. There has to be conflict. Like I said, conflict is not always bad, but it's for a reason and it's purpose. It's not because I was offended. Not many things. It's like, listen, I have to protect my home. Right? Mm-hmm. So conflict is not a big thing. But when we're seeking peace in the body of Christ, we have to be very mindful of what we choose wor- is worthy of conflict. Mm-hmm. You know? And so if people are showing discord in the group or lying about us, that would be a worthy discussion about conflict. You know, the Bible says, that, you know, so you have against your brother, go to him. And if they don't respond, then you can basically bring another and then go before the church. So there's a hierarchy of how to approach these situations. But for the most part, a lot of our offenses are stupid, you know, and they're over easy to overlook. And we're just taking offense to take offense. Right. And so we just need to let it go. Right. And be the people we want them to be. Often we want people to be more than we are. They're like, you need to be this way. Well, be, you be that way. <laughs> you know, you want something done, you do it. What, maybe God's putting it on your heart and you think it's for the other person. It's actually for you, you know? And so that's why we have to always be thinking, how can I make this happen? Not you need to make this happen for me, you know? And so, and especially like in marriages and friendships and with children, it's even more important. Marriage is big time, you know? So if I was always expecting Melissa to take care of every, every women need of mine, what a burden for her. But, you know, how easy to be offended by me. Could you imagine putting that burden on her and she has four kids? Why aren't you here quick enough? I want my dinner at six I'm on the table every day. You know, well, good luck with that with four kill, uh, children, right? And so we have a generalized time when we want to have dinner, but I wouldn't put that burden on her. You're right. We can't do it to our friends. We can't do it to our children, right? And like Melissa is super sweet to me because she makes it easy for me. Holidays, anniversaries, she reminds me, mm-hmm. you know? And so, um, you know, if we're servants to all men, you know, and we're willing to forgive a trespass and an offense and things that, you know, come against us all, especially in this ministry, you know, there has been so much stuff. <laughs> and so it's like this. I'll, I'll put it to you this way. Do you have a backpack and the saint wants to pull it full of junk mm-hmm. and hurt and burden and offense to wear you out so you can't be functional for God? Mm-hmm. And you have to decide what you let in that backpack, right. you know, and what you kick out through the power of Christ. Mm-hmm. I've learned to kick it all out because none of it's point, worth it. Because I've learned that in order to be useful for Christ and do what he wants me to do, I can't be burned with it. Mm-hmm. Right. And so if you're going to be the servant of all men, crucify your own flesh, you know, and, and pour yourself out for people, you don't, you're not going to have time to be offended. Mm-hmm. You, especially, you know, because there's times where I want to be like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, come on, you know. But then I realize that, like, all that does is speak to the devil, destroys my testimony, mm-hmm. right, and then gets my attention off of the goal. What's the goal? Mm-hmm. Help people in their walk with Christ and get them where they need to be, right? Mm-hmm. And so we have to decide what's an, an offense. Now, there's some things that have to be like, you know, people talking bad about my wife and that kind of stuff, you know, and calling her B words or something like that. Yeah. I'll be all over that. Or you come over to my house and try to hurt my kids. Well, I'll just, you know, I, I ain't going to say what I'm going to do, but, uh, it won't be pretty, you know, but when it comes to me personally and what I do, I, you just have to drop it all. That's my advice. Just let it all go. Unless it's causing physical abuse or something like that. And most of it's mental, emotional, you know, and people want to talk about it. Well, they talked about, about Jesus, you know, they lied about him. They entrapped him, you know, the same with the disciples when they couldn't find anything to go against them. They made up stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, right. so it doesn't matter how good you are, or how well you do things right. People are going to say what they're going to say. They're going to do what they're going to do. And so you have to weigh it out. Is this going to help the gospel or not? If it's not, then and it's not something that's drastic that has to be dealt with. Then just let it go. Because all it is, you have to realize it's the devil eating you, distracting you, pulling you down and getting you onto a path that is going to get you off the path God has you on. So God wants you to be useful, functional, and full steam ahead for the gospel, right? And like Paul talks about his big list of all the offenses and stuff he went through and betrayed by neighbors and friends and the Jewish nation and the and Gentiles, hungry, starving, shipwrecked, whooped. What'd he do? Full steam ahead. Got beat and almost died. 
or we did die and was resurrected and got back up, going back to preach. He didn't sit out there and tend to his wounds, whine and cry about how much it hurt his feelings and they and then say negative things. You know, he's like, oh, hey, back to the goal. You know, I'm going back in. Let's go, guys. <laughs> you know, and that's how we have to be where we, like what Bible says, lay, lay off every weight that so easily besets us, mm -hmm. you know. And so we have to do that. We have to just be able to drop stuff. And it takes practice and effort, you know. And so, and it takes time to learn how to do that and not... You know, it's like how many times have we talked to you? Somebody has to take the hit. Somebody has to stop the slapping, right? Like I slap you, you keep slapping, 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 slapping. We just keep slapping each other, right? Somebody has to go, okay, I'm not slapping anyone. I'm done with this. And someone, so you could be that person. I could be that person. We all could be that person. And especially in the body of Christ, you have to be that person. You know, you have to like learn to just let it go and, and look past it. Even if it's hard, it doesn't mean it's not hard. It doesn't mean it's not a struggle. It doesn't mean you don't have emotions. God never tells us not to have emotions. It's what we do with them. You know, and it's like, okay, how do I refocus into your lane, into what you want and what you want to accomplish? You know, and if we can do that and then we'll be better off, you know, and especially in marriage, especially with children and friends, it's amplified. Because you're around these people all the time. And if you always recall an offense, every time you see that person, you know, first of all, you're never letting them grow out of it. You say so you're holding a burden over them you know, that they can't get around and you're not letting them get around. Yeah. Right. And it just, it destroys you. Like you're letting them sin more too. Because right. Well, it's like, you know, say you walk up and you, you slap me. Mm -hmm. And then basically if I'm unforgiving of that, I'm getting slapped every day of my life from that mm -hmm. point forward. Right. Cause I'll never let that pain go. Mm -hmm. Right. And I was like, Oh, it hurts so bad. Oh, it hurts so bad. I remember yesterday. I remember you go 10 years ago. She's let me. And I've met people like that, mm -hmm. you know, that like they, there's something like so far ago and they're still hung on it. You know, mm -hmm. they're just bound up by it and they'll never move on life. And that's what the devil wants. So I don't know if I answered your question, but my advice is to let everything go. Let just let it go. Cause like God has a plan. Satan has a plan. Mm -hmm. You know, if you want to be useful for Christ and God, you're just going to take a lot of stuff. People are going to mean, they're going to say things. Mm -hmm. Don't exalt yourself. Just take it and move on. Mm -hmm. Cause we're here to represent Jesus and do good things and kind things, you know, and if the devil knows that tactic works, he'll keep using it. Right. Like the excuses people use not to do what God knows that they know God wants them to do and they keep using that same excuse. Mm -hmm. That's the same problem that will keep coming in their lives until they break it by obedience. Right. And so if people are easily distracted or, you know, like, yeah, I don't want to get too direct, but like, you know, like with this Bible study, how many things have happened on Thursday? Mm -hmm. Everything. All right. You know, and I'm not faulting one of us for not being here today, but that happened on Thursday. Mm -hmm. You know, oh, I was up late last night before, so I can't get up. You know, it's just, so these excuses won't stop until people obey. That's right. You know, it's just like with giving. Well, I don't have money to give. Well, you won't ever have money to give because you won't break it through obedience. And the time you give is when you don't have the money. Right. And that breaks it spiritually to opens up the doorways. Exactly. Right. And it's it, all things, all things. You want it broken? Don't let the devil know that tactic will work. Yeah. Break it and move forward. That's right. You know, and that's what you have to do. And then after a while, you're resisting the devil. He'll, he'll flee. He's like, well, that doesn't work anymore. You know, and yes, he'll try something else. Believe me. And you just have to keep telling him no. Right. But, you know, people get hung up on one problem and they get stuck in it and they never move past it because it works and the devil knows it. And so, um, ba -bow, ba -bow. Uh, recap. recap. Yes. Um, okay. Uh, and I think I, we did first Peter three, nine through 11, but I don't know if I talked about it, but, uh, um, yeah, basically we did. We did. Okay. Um, recap. We have covered that to try to be friends with the world will make God our enemy. We have learned that in order to be true friends in God's will, those we call friends must be obedient believers in Jesus. In order to be a faithful friend, we must be doing the same. If one side has failed, then you will be unequally yoked. We also covered how to be a friend and how to love your friends and how to act like Jesus in our friendships. I would say that to have a few Bible-based friends doing it God's way is a thousand times better than a hundred friends that barely know you or care about God. If we have these God-centered, faith-filled friendships in our lives, we should count our blessings and give God praise, then to protect and invest in uh, and invest into them. Good friends are very hard to find. Treat them like the precious gifts they are. Be the friend you want others to be. Set the example and be the change you desire in your relationships. Never expect your friends to do for you what you are not willing to do for them. Lastly, your primary responsibility as a friend is to encourage your friends to love God. Amen. 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 Yeah.
go ahead and pray. Daniel, you ready to pray? Still ready to recap. Oh, I think I have three. <laughs> you know, I, I get a little older. Oh, three oh, friends. Boy. Three? Oh, yeah. <laughs> You got a lot of friends in this room. <laughs> Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we praise you. We thank you for all that you do for us, for taking care of us, to help us understand this profound doctrine that all good relationships in this life are based around you and people's love and obedience to you, and that we could set that example in our friendships and be those things that we want to see in other people. And so it has to start here and not in them. So give us the power and the Holy Spirit to do those things that we would like to see in other people, to be that example, to be like Christ, to die for our friends and family, and that uh, we could be pleasing yourself to just overlook every offense, Father, and not let the devil saddle us with emotional burdens and pains, but get up and keep moving fast, as fast as possible, Father, and uh, give us wisdom when we know that, that conflict is necessary if the, the offense is so great that it needs to be dealt with and covered, Father. So we praise you, and we thank you for everything, and uh, please bless the rest of our week. Help us a beautiful Sunday, and we thank you for all you do for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. If you feel so led of the Lord and want to know how to donate to this ministry outreach, please visit brotherlance.com and scroll down to the bottom of the main page for the PayPal link. Thank you, and may God's blessing rest upon you. Brotherlance.com